Please put your hands together and help me give a warm welcome to our host, Miss Laura Daniel. Wow. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I, uh, I, I feel very humbled to be on the stage with these four um, Hall of Famers. I, I, of course, I'm here with Full Sail. I teach in the DAD, Digital Arts and Design Program. Uh, and I'm here for you anytime you need me, so just let me know. But I'm going to go ahead and let these guys introduce themselves one at a time and say what's important to them, and then we'll open it up to questions after that. So we'll get all of everything talked about. So I will start right here, right here. All right, I'll, go, I'll run with that. I'm, uh, I'm Jack Eckler. I'm a crowd supervisor at Industrial Light and Magic. I graduated from computer animation in 2000. Uh, I am currently working on an unannounced project, but uh, I've worked on Hawkeye recently. I also was at Disney Animation for the last three years prior to that, where I had wrapped up in Kanto and Frozen 2 and done a lot of other fun stuff before that. So just excited to be here with you guys on this panel. What's up? I'm uh, Jamison Doral. I'm a 2001 grad. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> game design and development. Uh, spent time at Oddworld, EA, Deep Silver Volition, and I'm currently an advanced senior game designer at Insomniac Games, working on Spider-Man 2. Hello, everybody. My name is Tom Todia, and I'm an audio director at Electronic Arts Tiburon. Uh, Thank you. All right. <laughs> Currently uh, heading up audio for our college football title, which we're which is in production right now. Uh, I've been there about four or five years. Um, and before games, I was a studio engineer uh, and did a little bit of film sound as well. And uh, my interest is making friends here, which we also call networking. So thanks for coming. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Demo. I am a 2001 Recording Arts grad um, from Hall of Fame 5, right? 5, yeah. And uh, I spent the last uh, two and a half decades working with some of the most amazing artists on the planet. I've worked every position from engineering to production to producing, creative director, executive producer, tons of stuff. And a lot of it working around managing creatives and helping creatives help me do my job better, which is kind of the field we're going to play in today. So I'm excited to be here, and I'm excited for all the questions. Y'all excited? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well, then, really, I think the best thing to do at this point is these guys have so much talent and so much experience that working with creatives and, and the like is what they know. So why don't we start with a question and maybe let it go through the process of Actually, developing. you know what? I, got, I have one. Okay. I, just, I want to hear from everyone. It gives me time to figure out what mine is. But what is, what is the one thing, Jack, let's say we'll start with you. What is the one th thing that you see is most important when managing creatives? That, honestly, it's one of the things that's super important for me, and it was kind of important in my career to get to a position to where I could manage creatives. Because as you go through your, your career, uh, whether or not it's even doing this stuff or like early, like you had to work retail or you're a waiter somewhere, like you're always looking at how people are treating you. And it's usually the, the, a manager of some sort who's how they're treating you. And I would be in all these situations, specifically when I got in the industry of like, you knew pretty quick like, I really don't like working with this person, or this person doesn't really know how to get people to do what they want to do. And I used to look at that and be like, I want to be where he's at so I could do it right. So it's one of those things that I've, I've been excited to finally be in a position to do that because I can look back and be like, I know what to do wrong. So now, now all those mistakes are out of the way. Now I know how to actually treat artists. And it's amazing once you kind of figure that out and start treating them the way you've always wanted to be treated, the amount of support they give you, like Demo was saying, they, they literally, they'll jump off bridges for you to support you, and that to me is amazing. Like, the more I build them up, the more they build me up. So it just, it's, it's awesome. Like, I, I, love, I love being able to do that now. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I, I think the main thing for me is, when you're working with creatives, it's about enabling and fostering the creativity, right? And 
there there is no one size fits all for this everybody's creative process is a little bit different and people that are just getting into this like you guys are learning now you're discovering what your creative process is and understanding and and, and asking the right questions of like i'm someone who's neurodivergent i am a to the wait to the last minute type person to get something done but that's that pressure at the end is what allows me to to quickly kind of get to the right answer whereas other people they need that long lead time to kind of work on something develop collaborate more up front so understanding how each individual does that best and then trying to help enable them to do that is something that fascinates me and i think is an important part of it yeah, yeah that's a good one um I'm going to speak specifically about the kind of work that I do right now, because I used to work as an independent contractor mostly. Uh, my partner and I have a contract company. We were from EA, Ubisoft, different uh, production teams. And that was very different, because it was the two of us. We're both creatives. We both run around in circles. We both waste time. We both procrastinate. That's just the way that creative people are in general. Mm -hmm. As you get onto a larger team, like I work on a fairly large team now that I manage, things are very different. We need task management. Creative people sometimes are not great at keeping timelines, at making deadlines. They know they need to, but managing it is not simple. So we use really specific task management software. We scope out sprints where we know for the next two weeks, this is your assignment, this is what you're working on. It's my job to get you all the details of what you need to know to get that task finished and to do what we've called just unblocking. I mean, our jobs as managers is always to make sure that our creatives are unblocked, they know exactly where they're headed, they understand velocity, and that they update us on a regular basis with their work. You know, because if you work for a whole week straight and then just say, oh, I'm done now on a Friday, that's really hard for us to manage. But if at the end of each day we add a little note, oh, I spent three hours working on this, this is how far I got, here's a link to the Google Drive where I put it, stuff like that. Now we can all manage each other's time, see how the work is flowing. I used to hate that kind of stuff as a junior sound designer, or as, a, as a junior music producer as well. Now that I'm getting older and I'm getting more into it, it makes life so much easier because you want your creative people to just feel like they can do what they need to do and not be stressed out about Excel documents or not be stressed out about time management things. You might not be that good at it. And if you're not, that's fine. If you're really good at what you do, I don't want you to worry about that kind of stuff. I wanna make sure the road in front of you is obvious and that we're updating our tasks all the time so at the end of the month, we all know exactly where the team is at. Which one do you use? Uh, we use Jira and a system called Jazz. Yeah. I use OmniFocus. You can get it in the App Store. It's really good. It costs a little bit to get the pro, but I think there's a free version. Do you got one, Jameson? I'll use Jira as well. Jira as well? Yeah, they, uh, what I find like the bigger the studio, they tend to go to a Jira system just so it's tracked really well across multiple sites. Okay. Yeah. Lauren, do you have one? There are plenty of systems. I think Asana is the one I mainly work Asana. with. I work with uh, developers that all over the globe on websites, and so that one seems to work well, but there are plenty of them. That, gotcha. that work. That's good. Good to know. I saw somebody's hand about to go up. Back there. Do you have a mic for her right there? Say your Hi. name and your program. Sure, absolutely. My name is Talia Rodriguez. I'm in the computer animation program. And one of the biggest things that I have realized um, looking at the topic of today is we're talking about creatives. And in that, we all know that as creatives, we all think differently. There's so many different types of creative types. So in the industry with whatever you guys ha are doing or have done, what, how have you managed working with those creatives? I'll, I'll start on that one. I have a really diverse team that I work with, all incredibly bright people, most of them way smarter and more creative than I am. Um, but there are so many different personalities within a large team. For instance, I have one, there's one guy on my team that is literally a genius in everything that doesn't involve talking to other human beings. <laughs> and he really does not appreciate it, he doesn't like it, it's not his thing, and we know each other quite well. So to get the best out of him and to make sure he wants to stay because he's enjoying being with us as well, I just take that out of the loop. I don't invite him to certain meetings. He's not gonna enjoy it. If anyone asks him a question, he's gonna get upset and not wanna deal with it. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's just the way that he behaves. He doesn't have to be in every single meeting. So, and then I have other people that I have to keep them out of meetings because they will not shut up. They will take the agenda and move. I've got an idea, I've got a plan, you know, and it's like, that's not what we're talking about today. So you really have to get to know your people on a personal level and know what their strengths are, but also not, Everybody has to work together, but you can't expect to break people to make them something that they're not. 
if you're really good at what you do and you come to work every day and you work with us, I'm not gonna try and force you into a box where you do not exist or you're not happy, only for selfish reasons, because that means in the next year or two, you're gonna leave my team. And that's gonna be terrible for me, you know? So we don't wanna coddle people or like, you know, emphasize bad habits or make it think like you don't have to be professional or be on time and do your work. But within that framework, there's so much room to grow and let people feel comfortable and be what they're really, really good at. If you're with a group or a production team or a company that's not allowing that in any way, keep working, keep getting experience, but start looking for other places. There's other places out there. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say for for me like and specifically on the feature film side when we do stuff, you know, we as as and I'm going to I'm going to come at it from a supervisor standpoint. We look at a show and we look at okay, this is how many shots we have in a movie and maybe it's a bigger show for us and it's 500 shots. As a supervisor working with creatives and, and Tom was touching on this, you're you're always looking at like your team what are all their strengths? What are their weaknesses? And then my job, you know, in this idea of like, okay, I know we have 500 shots on this film is to really break it down to be like, one, where do I think everybody fits in this puzzle? Like what sequences I think you're gonna be really strong at, but there's also managing to like, I want you to be happy. So sometimes those conflict, right? And for me, I try really hard to find the middle ground because clearly as a supervisor, when we're in that position, we're answering to people above us that if we're doing our jobs right, you guys will never see or talk to because we're handling that for you. But I also, I want you to really enjoy working with me. So what I'll do typically in those kind of scenarios is like, I don't know if you can do it, but like, I'm gonna test the water. So maybe I'll give you a couple shots in that sequence just to see how you kind of do or, or one similar, and then I'll cast it appropriately. But there's other times I go and I know right away. This guy's getting these 20 shots. He's gonna knock it out of the park. I don't have to stress about it. So a lot of my time is spent with that. And part of that too is just getting to know the team. Like I spent a lot of time with one-on-ones, just one-on-one -on -one meetings where I'm just trying to get to know you. Cause that tells me a lot about how I'm gonna cast you, where you wanna go and, and kind of what direction and, and basically how I, how I should supervise you. Kind of what Tom was saying. I've worked with people like that too. I, you know, I, I, I know they don't get along with anybody else on the team, but there's such a powerhouse in this that I know I really need them. So I try to insulate that as much as possible because, you know, the show still goes on. So you just try to find a way to make that work. But yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. I like what I do. Yeah. But I just want to quickly add, you led right into what I was thinking about, which is, you know, that getting the manager to understand you, right? You knowing how to facilitate that. When you start, you're not going to be managing. You're going to be the one that's managed, yeah. right? And it is important that you are very transparent about how you work, what is important to you, how, where you're going to excel, right? So then the manager has a better opportunity of putting you in the right places and giving you those opportunities. It is always, always a good idea to be uh, like transparent about your goals and your ambitions and and the way that you the way that you work best. Hundred percent. Yeah, there's there's there's. I'm glad they both they kind of really all summed it up. Um, there is two sides of it, because there's when you're managing and when you're being managed. For me, when I'm being managed, I, I, got, I got to constantly get my ego in check. Because sometimes you're going to be managed by somebody that shouldn't be managing you. I mean, that, that's going to happen at some point in your career. So, but I say to myself, okay, this person is saying something that's triggering me, or this, this person is saying, what, what really is it? that's really triggering me. Like, what is, okay, maybe I'm not as confident in this, or maybe I don't know whether I feel like I'm the right person for the job. So it's a good good part of awareness, but what I manage across the board is I keep, keep a good attitude. Regardless of what it, the person managing you is, I always keep a good attitude and professional. That's, even when you're managing people, you wanna do that. And I do similar to Jack, where I interview a lot of people, and I spend time with them. And then I start seeing how they're going to mesh with the other people I'm looking to bring on the team. So pre-production, a lot of pre-production in the front end. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Lauren, you got anything on that? Managing creatives? I think just to be about, when you talk to, when you come into interviews and you talk to fellows like you, I think it's important that you be yourself so that, and just like he was saying, be transparent. Let them know your likes, your dislikes in a diplomatic way. Right. And, right. and because part of working together is being able to work together and to get along and ha having similar, you know, the similar goal. And I think that's super important. And, you know, is, is there anything else you can add about what you're looking for when you're actually interviewing 
uh, newcomers? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a huge thing. I actually talked about this a bit yesterday for me because I, I'm in the process of like, we still need to hire four to six people for my department. And so I've been going through these interview processes and um, it's kind of surprised me the number of people who, uh, and maybe it's just the new breed of people coming through who will show up to interviews with egos. You're talking about checking ego, mm -hmm. but these are people who have just started. So I'm sitting in these interviews just mind blown. I'm like 20 years in and they just, is their second job. And they're talking to ILM, which is maybe their dream studio, but they're, oh, this, me, this, and, and you're like, what? Okay, because I remember me, I was just, it was the most humbling experience. When I interviewed for ILM the first time, I'd been in the industry 15 years, and I was still humbled. So to have somebody new come in with that kind of just ego. Also, another thing with me is we've had a, I've had a bunch of people come there where they're just, they don't smile, and they're very stoic the entire interview. And my personality is I'm just, I like to have fun because our team's so small, we have fun. Yeah. And if you're in an interview, even if you're the most, because I know you're talented, I, I'm, I'm interviewing you. That means I've looked at your resume, I've looked at your work, I've told HR, call him in for the interview, call her in for the interview. So I know that already. What at this point I'm doing is, do I want to work with you? Mm. Do, do, do I want you to be around my team? Will you mesh with my team? And at that point to me, it's honestly, it's more about personality. So it always surprises me the number of people who, I don't even think that they realize you have the job, it's yours to lose at this point. Because I, I have you here, so I want to hire you. Just be yourself, be calm. And I get nerves, but do your best to push through it. Smile, act happy to be there. <laughs> That goes a long way. Yeah, like write that down. Smile. Be happy Remember to, be to smile. Yes. Be happy. Yeah. Be happy to be there. Yeah, yeah. I, I bring that up because we have post interviews, meaning like it was usually me as supervi another supervisor and our HR director, like a recruiter. And then when you hang up off the Zoom interview right now, we stick around and we talk about you. And like the last couple has been like right away, he didn't, she didn't smile at all and I, I would crack jokes where the rest of us would kind of laugh stoic yeah. but that'd be like first thing we'll talk about and it's like we get worried like it's a flag like yeah. oh man is this going to be cool when we're like working late and we're all together like is this going to be weird or awkward yeah. because i don't want to make them feel awkward either but i have six other people to worry about yeah. And that's how I view it. And that there's a big difference between confidence and bravado. Yes. You know, when he's talking about ego, confidence is really hard to manufacture if you don't feel confident. And I know that because I don't always feel confident. But here's something. Stop telling yourself all the time you're not good with confidence. I hear people say this all the time. I'm not good with that. The second you say that, it becomes true. You just believe it. Instead, just say, you know what? I am confident. That seems like a really simple thing to do. It actually works. Being confident means you can sit in a room and look across the table at somebody, anybody, and just give me the impression, like he said, you're glad to be here. You want to be here. That's the point. Not that you deserve it or like, why did it take so long for you to recognize how awesome I am? Some people come across that way and it's a weird level of confidence. You don't want to do that, uh, but you do want, and you also want to think about the word. We're talking about creatives, right? Like what's the main word in creative? It's create. create. If you're a creative, that means you're creating stuff. When I'm interviewing, and lately in, James, in our industry, we have so much hiring going on right now. We, we've never been looking for more people in our industry. I'm not saying that as a joke, it's true. it's true. I've had open positions for so long that I'm trying to fill and there's more and more of them all the time. It wasn't like that when I was in looking into my field at all. It was really hard to find 15 years ago. Now they're everywhere. Um, so we do tons of interviewing lately. And when I'm sitting across the table from somebody, I can see sometimes there's a body language issue and I'm thinking, don't worry, relax. I know this is nerve wracking. It's kind of nerve wracking for me too but take a deep breath and let's get through this and get to know each other. And if you're brand new, right, you're just getting out of school. So your resume might not be massive. You might not have an amazing demo. Maybe it's something you worked on in class. You didn't even like it that much. If I'm interviewing five people today and one of the five people has a project they're working on that they can talk about right now, even if it's alone, just your own idea, you're a creative. You should be creating something all the time. If you're spending a week not doing a project, even a prototype, just a thought, an idea, something you want to try, that makes me really nervous. So during the interview, I'll often ask, uh, what are you working on right now? And I see people shuffle and get to a point like, well, I'm not on any projects right now. I said, well, not with other people, but what are you doing on your own? What are you working on, an idea? Nothing. Okay, well, you're not one of us then, are you? You're not really doing it. You have to be working on stuff all the time. 
and don't be afraid to share it. Some people think, I can't show this off until it's perfect. It's not right yet, it's just not right. I have to show off stuff to my management all the time that I'm not ready to show off, and I don't want to do. But that's just the way that it is. You have to do that as part of the process. I can tell you about rough mixes. There's nothing worse than playing a rough mix for somebody. You want to wait till the last second, <laughs> playing the best thing, but that's not the way projects work. No. Have some confidence, look somebody in the face, and act like you actually want to be there and be proud of the ideas that you have. I've had an idea in game audio. I've always wanted to try this. If it's interesting, I think, I never thought of that. That's a really cool idea. I don't think it'll work, but I get why you're thinking that way. Well, now we're having a real conversation, and that means probably if you join the team, you're going to come up with some other things that I never even thought of, and that's definitely what we're looking for. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to touch on a little bit what you were just saying, because I think the thing, especially when you're interviewing, we're not looking for a polished person. Set of, you know, like we're, we know that every, all this is about the process, mm. right? And what I always tell people is, you know, have your portfolio, you know, small 30 second segments that shows what you did, specifically talk about what you did on that thing. Because what I can't see in a portfolio is your thought process and how you go through things. And that's the kind of things you should be talking about and ready to talk about. Like if you don't have something you're working on, at least have a thought in your mind where you're like, it can just be as simple as I've got an idea for something that I've started the planning process for. And I've broken it down a little bit and so that you can talk about how you do that and the way you think about that. And that gives us insight into, oh, they kind of work how we do or, oh, we see the bits that are important to us in our process, they can fit in here pretty well and we can teach them the rest. We're, especially when you're new, we know we're going to teach you a lot and that, that's okay. That's part of it. We know you're new. Yeah, right. You're not fooling nobody. <laughs> <laughs> you're not fooling nobody. You know, um, the interviewing process in general, and this goes when you start interviewing people for your team, it, it's not so much the work. The interview process, once you get it, it's like Jack said, it's yours to lose. Once you get the callback, which every one of you at some point will get the callback. Once you get the callback, you got the gig. They just want to know whether you're the right person, whether you're ready to take it. It's the difference, the nuance. So when you walk in, it's those kind of things like be humble. Be, now, being humble is not this. Some of y'all do this. It's humble. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna cower in myself. No, you stand in your power. I've been saying that all week. It's like stand in you. There, there's some confidence in going. I don't know everything, but I'm willing to learn. That's what's expected when you leave here. That you have the attitude of learning. You came from a learning establishment where it's safe. Now you're going into the workforce where you will need to continue to learn. We, we do it all the freaking time. I mean, Don't you can't stop. get around it. You got to keep investing in yourself. So humble smile, these things. Some of y'all should be writing this down. I see y'all kind of like, oh, this is great. I meant to like, <laughs> write it down. You're going to forget it if you don't write it down. Um, I know there was a question somewhere. That's right. This is your memory. Can you get him a mic, please? Name and program, buddy. Uh, my name's Andre Johnson, and then the uh, Game Design Master's program. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping to one day own my own company, and I'm wondering what techniques or like methodologies you guys might use when the crunch time comes. How do you keep creative people creative under intense pressure? That's a good question. How do you keep creative people creative under pressure? Um, we're always under pressure. I mean, we're, that, that's literally what we do for a living. If you plan to make films, games, digital art, music production, it's literally pressure from the beginning to the project, the middle to the end of the project. It, you, you're never gonna get rid of stress or pressure, but learning to manage it and not let it overwhelm you and use it as a little bit of fuel is crazy important. Also, but planning, because you said crunch time, right? We want to avoid crunch time as much as possible. Some people speak of it like it's a rite of passage and it's really good, and it's actually not. It's bad for the team, it's bad for our emotions, it's bad for our family life if we have one and then they don't want to come to work there anymore. So what you need to do is really plan carefully, and that takes a good manager. In all honesty, that's my job more so now, is to recognize everybody on my team and their scope and their velocity, what they're capable of, assign them the proper tasks, give them the proper window, and then follow up. Uh, Jack mentioned earlier, we do one-on-ones. I do one-on-ones with every member of my team as often as possible, every other week at least, where we sit down for a half hour and it's basically like a safe space. If they want to rant and vent about something, fine, go ahead. If they want to say why things are not quite going well, they need a little support, they thought they knew how to do something but it's not working out well, is there anybody that can mentor them on it? 
The important thing is to communicate and not wait till the last second, which is hard to do when you work on your own. I've been a freelance contractor with my own LLC work, and I procrastinate and wait, and then crunch time is overwhelming, and you can literally get physically ill if you put yourself through that much pressure. So you wanna space it out appropriately, give yourself time and manage that data and know that the creativity will always be there. It's something that you love. Like I can't stop thinking about sound design. It's not gonna dry up one day because I'm in a bad mood. It's always there. Um, but you need to pace your time appropriately and not wait till the last second because you're not doing anybody any favors. You're likely to lose a client that you do that with because that means they're waiting too long to get the material as well. And even if it goes well, that might be the last time that they call you. So, yeah. so look at the whole project and really pace it out and think without the rose colored glasses. I have a big problem of doing this. Someone offers me some work and I look at it and my brain says that's 10 hours worth of work. That's 10 hours in a vacuum of perfection where I'm left alone and I'm in the zone and everything is going right. It doesn't happen that way. So if I know I'm, I'm looking at it and I think that's 10 hours of work, I know for a fact it's 20. There's no way it's 10. My immediate response is always too low and too wrong because I think I'm too good and I'm gonna do it that quickly. So give yourself enough time and space to really do it correctly and space it out across the project. And there will be crunch time, no matter how good you do, at the end, we all get into a bit of overtime. You just don't want it to be 70, 80, 90 hours. A little bit of overtime, sure. I, I want to add something real quick because it's really important. You have to do the time. You, know, you have to figure out, okay, how much time is this going to take me? But you're also going to find times where you're trying to be creative and you hit a wall and you just can't do anything anymore. You need to stop. You need to do something else. You, I like to stop and do something physical. Go on a walk, you know, make some food. Do something where you take it out of your brain for a second. Your brain's still working on it back here. Take yourself away from it and then come back with fresh eyes, fresh mind, and you're gonna find that it's gonna be a little easier to be creative because you've taken some of the valve, taken the pressure off of a little bit. Yeah. I mean, what, what I was going to add to that, like you in particular with where you were saying you're wanting to, where you want to own your own studio, you're in another position, not just in trying to manage expectations of your team and keep them healthy, because that's one of the bad parts about crunch time, right? You're going to burn people out. You're also having to look at it from the financial standpoint, right? So if you're, you're like, sure, there's a little buffer you're going to put in there for crunch time, but all that crunch is really doing is just adding money to the overall project, and that's not a good thing. Yeah. Or you're eating it. So like now you're physically losing money when you're in crunch time, and I've seen both scenarios happen. Uh, and like Tom, I've always said, it is never a good thing. And I think all of us have been there though, unfortunately. Yeah. So we know what that's like. But every time I've been in that, I just have never got, especially the days over like 12 hours. If you guys have ever done over like me, once I hit 12, I know now. After 20, 12 is my max. Yep. Anything after 12, you are just getting a body in a seat mm. who is, I, I am not creating. You're probably anything. doing more harm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Cause I, th those scenarios, you come back the next day and you look at whatever like your last file was or whatever you're looking at, like, oh. And then you're spending maybe one to two hours fixing what you, those last couple. And so to me, it's never made sense. So back to that pre planning, so important. Yeah. So important up front. Well, and on that point, speaking to you as the people who will be managed, you're going to be really bad at this at first, right? Like knowing how long it takes you to do something, knowing how to, you know, work with your team to say, this is the kind of time allocation we have for this. This is how my piece fits. And understanding the scope of that stuff is difficult. You learn over time. Yeah, it's another one of those times where you have to be open and honest about, I think it's going to take me this time. And then, then that planning now becomes an iterative thing, right? So as you're going through, being as open and upfront as possible as saying, hey, I'm not quite reaching this goal yet. Don't wait until the last minute to say you're getting behind because the earlier you do it, the more resources and opportunities we have to fix it. We can give you support. We can scope. Those things help early. That being said, and no matter how much you... Pre-production you do, you know, at some point or another, you're going to catch yourself in a situation where all hell is breaking loose. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Every one of you. Yeah. Here's the deal. In this, if you're managing, everyone is going to look at you. Yeah. And if you're doing this, <laughs> it is not going to work out. I'll tell you, uh, 
my homeboy Scott Spieler's back here. He's another Hall of Famer. Give Scott a round. I mean, uh, Scott, Sean. I said Scott. Sean Spieler's in back. Um, I said Scott. I was thinking myself. I said Sean. Um, but Sean would tell you this: like we've been on tour together, and sometimes things the artist is going like they're they're pretty heated, and they're going crazy, and I just sit there with a straight face. Like I don't show the panic, and it actually helps because other people can't. If he's not panicking, then we're okay. And it's the other way too. If you're being managed and everybody's freaking out, and I this happened to me recently. I was part of something, and the person who was supervising had a complete meltdown, and it was a situation that was a, it definitely rendered a meltdown. But. I was cool, calm, and collected. Now, mind you, my heart was going 180. It was literally pounding out of my chest. I could feel my pressure rise. I was shook because I was like, this could be a really bad situation. Someone could actually get hurt because of the way this situation was going. But I just breathed. I said, okay, relax, cool out. Because if you start tripping, like you start firing off all sorts of things in your mind, you go into uh, fight or flight, and you don't think straight. In those situations, you need to think straight. So if you stay calm, centered, you say, okay, as long as no one's about to die, you know, you just stay calm, centered, and say, okay, what's the next thing that needs to happen? What's the next thing that needs to happen? Because if you do that, everybody else, you got to kind of be the model. And if you're the model, everybody else tends to follow, whether you're being managed or whether you're the manager. So does that help? It does. All right, give them a round of applause for questions. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> shot. There was just one extra addition, I'm sorry, right before the question is to add to that, because you're talking about managing your own business, and really quickly, because I've done this before, is getting the right amount of information out of your client. That helps with crunch time. You learn that over time. If your information coming in is too vague, you can do some really amazing work, and you get it to your client, you're like, yeah, that's not at all what I was thinking. This is what I had in mind. Okay, well, you didn't say that, and I already did the work, and you already yeah. spent the money. Yeah, but you're gonna have to do it again yeah. now. So I've gotten <laughs> to the point now where I qualify what my client needs, and we agree, or what we call alignment, on that ahead of time, mm -hmm. and then when we turn in that creative work, if they go to my creative uh, person and say, well, I need this redone, that's my job, I step in, no, no, no. You need to go back to your planning board and break <laughs> off some more budget because yeah. we did our work appropriately. Yeah. But you can't say that if you don't get the information up front because you literally didn't know what they want, but you agreed to get that work done for that much money. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Preston Canavan, and I'm in the creative writing program. Hey. Uh, I was wondering, in the context of uh, working with peers as opposed to a manager, managee hierarchy, how do you get people to, uh, how do you inspire commitment? This might be a question more geared towards the ghost of Dale Carnegie, but how do you inspire commitment in, uh, in deadlines and uh, finishing things? Well, that's good that you're reading Carnegie. That's a good, yeah. that's a good, good start. Got it, buddy. How do you inspire commitment? Well, you got to have a good elevator pitch. That's what I say. Like, I, I never approach an idea unless I've sold myself on it first. And I'm never going to bring anybody else on board until I know for a fact that this is a really good idea. Because a lot of times, especially with peers, if you ain't got no money especially, um, it has to be something that they can see that it's worth their time and that there's a mutual benefit. So if there's a mutual benefit where someone either says it's going to help me grow or it's going to help my career expand or it's going to be just something that I'm interested in, you're more than likely to get them to be interested in joining you. Um, but a lot of times people say, yo, I got this project, you should work on it. And it's like, well, I don't want to work on that. I got my own things I got to work on, you know? Like, why, why? So it's, but when you sell something like, listen, I'm working with this amazing artist and this director, or I'm working with this incredible designer who has this incredible idea for a game or for a script, and this is going to be really fantastic. We have potentially, we can get some funding for it, but right now we don't, and this is what we're looking to do. The person's going, wow, this is something that could be interesting. So you got to sell the idea. You got to get a good elevator pitch before anything. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and I would also say, I'm just going to be honest, I don't really go through that very much. Uh, the people that are on my team and most of the people that I work around are incredibly passionate about what they do. I know that's like a term that we hear so much. It's like, what does that mean? We don't just go to work to get a paycheck, although that is a really good way to remind people of commitment. You want to stay working and stay <laughs> in this job. But generally, I don't ever have to address anything like that with people. One of the things, though, that helps with creative people is just making sure that they're not stuck in a corner or blocked. 
some people have this idea that asking too many questions is somehow showing that you are less than the other people that you're asking the questions of. What we do requires so much information. When I retire, I'm still not going to know it all. It's just not, it's never gonna happen, right? So make sure that people feel comfortable asking other people that are experts questions, laterally up and down. I'll go to people's rooms all the time and say, I know I could probably figure this out, but really, do you know how to do this? Because I need it done like right now. When you share that kind of stuff, thing, things tend to work well. And also when you manage the team and work with a team of creative people, we're, all go we're also egotistical. Not like in a negative sense all the time, some of us are, but in some the are. sense that like, we, yeah, some people are, uh, but in the sense that like we all want to do well. It's like a race and you just don't want to be the last person there. That doesn't mean you want it to be overly competitive, but there's a natural ego where if I do sound design and three other people here do sound design and mine's clearly not up to par over time, I put in extra time and extra hours because I just don't want to be that standout that's that in the back of the pack. You don't want to access it too much because that can be a really negative thing. You don't want anyone to think that they're in trouble. There's always somebody that needs to go backwards and forwards, but um, sharing information and feeling really comfortable communicating and asking for help is super important. The worst is when someone on one of our teams gets stuck in a corner and spends a week there before asking, and you're like, this is a team effort. We're all slowed down because of this now. I could have helped you a week ago in an hour and don't feel bad about asking. I've done it a thousand times. You've done it twice. It's no big deal at all. It, it, there's, there's no benefit to not asking people who are more experienced for help. And if you're on a team where people don't want to help, you know, they're kind of like that old IT person, like, get out of my way. Right? That's a negative atmosphere. And whoever that person's manager is should probably deal with that as soon as possible. Yeah, I think you, son. Yeah, like, I, I just want to add really quick to what Tom was saying. Like, we have a, I have a rule that I had learned from, I forget what studios out they had it, but it made sense to me, was like, it was a 10 minute rule. So what I tell the team, and this is, this is a peer to peer too, like I tell them, because our, my team right now is only six people, so it's, we're really close. So it's a 10 minute rule. If you spend more than 10 minutes trying to figure out that answer, ask. And it doesn't have to be like, it doesn't have to be me. We've set it up to each of us, like, ask anybody in the room. Like, we have a meeting that starts every day at 3.30, where we're just on Google Hangouts with us, and it's like, to BS, like we're back in the office, to ask questions, just to hang out. But that room's there for each of us to ask each other. Like, it's not just one thing, well, I can only ask Jack, because he's a supervisor on the show. I've tried to set it up for, no, because I might be in a meeting. And if you hit that, you've hit that wall, like at 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I still want you to get an answer, and most likely one of us know it. And it could be another, it could be the junior you're working with right next to you. So that's to me is a real good rule of thumb to just start with the 10 minute thing because it really does keep it in perspective so because good. time's money. That's so good. Did y'all write, do me a favor, somebody write that down for me. Yeah. Like, I want to copyright at the bottom, yeah, Jack Yackler. I want that here, please. <laughs> because Tom, like Tom's, uh, Tom's story there with the week thing, <laughs> we have had that happen. Because people will just get very insecure, and they feel like if I ask that question, they're gonna know they're gonna know I don't know what I'm doing. I still ask questions all the time because look, you're already at that level. Yeah. So if you're asking questions, we know it's just to try to get through. There's stuff that I have done 15 years, but if I don't do it for two years, I find myself back. And this just happened recently. I'm like, oh man, I gotta ask you this, dude. I haven't opened that in a while they always get it. They're like, oh, I've been there. My, you know, and nobody's upset at you. Like they're just trying to get, you know, and cause they know at some point they're going to have to ask you something similar. And that's just how it's a so secular. Yeah. And the, and the one quick caveat to that though, is body language though, too, because that's yeah. the worst. Yeah. Always ask questions, always be friendly, always it. share. Yeah. But we also have like, we have studios that, that we work in and we have doors. When a door is closed and someone is in that room and they've got the door closed and they're working and you see their head is down and they're in the middle of something, maybe you have a question, but that doesn't mean you go interrupt somebody that's deep in their zone. It's not always easy to get in the zone. I, I worked with somebody who could not read body language and it was a supervisor and I don't know how they got where they were. I'd be with my door closed in my room, monitors are on, everything's going, headphones on. That's the biggest clue that I don't want to be bothered right now. I'm literally ignoring you. Knock on the door, and I don't answer. Don't even. Did, did, he did that to you? Yeah, and then come into the room, open the door. I didn't answer the knock. Come up and interrupt me. And I'm, I've even looked before like this. And then I'm like, yes? What can I help you with? And then it's like, you've got to be kidding me. So that's the only one thing. Questions are always good. But if someone's really, really in this, just wait and come back in 20 minutes or so and make sure that they're not, you're not destroying their workflow.
Boy, y'all getting a lot of stuff in here. <laughs> Could I ask a question on that? Yeah. Um, so if, if that's the case, is there a secondary way they might get that question to you? Uh, maybe an email or something like that so that it doesn't yeah. slip? Because you might be in that zone for 12 hours. I don't mean specifically when yeah. that happens because that, yeah. that does happen to me. So it, it hasn't don't let that go. You when, know, yeah. if you have a question, get the question in there somewhere. If they're busy, know that, but make sure I'll, you find out. I'll send a chat. What most yeah. companies are work with or whatever else, you'll have some system. Like right now we're on Google, so I'll just send a Google, or maybe it's Slack. Yeah. But if I see that, like Tom, I've seen that, I'll just walk away. I'll go back to my desk. I'll send it. Hey, man, when you got a second, just let me know when you're free. And that goes a long way. Yeah, cool. And, and Slack is great for that, too. This has been the best thing of COVID is us using Slack at EA for everything, where it used to be emails. And that was the worst, because if you're not on that email, you didn't even know what's happening. You don't hear that communication. But in Slack, I have access to every Slack channel within our company and a really good search engine. Yeah. The odds are this problem that I'm having right now, someone else had it, and it has been answered by somebody in Slack. And a lot of times I can search and get the answer without even going to anyone and figuring out. So even when we go back to our building physically, I've said from now on, emails are still being used, but all questions that are being answered, get it into the Slack database because it's just gonna speed things up for everybody. And it's been really helpful. You just reminded me of one quick thing. Uh, I've started now saying, can you point me to the answer, right? Because there's so much stuff in Ooh. Confluence, you know, all those kind of things. So instead of trying, cause I know, I bet that person knows but I don't want them to have to describe it to me. But if they could point me to that page that describes it, because yeah. you know sometimes search engines don't work as well if you don't key things properly or whatever. Right. So yeah. uh, there's been a few times, and people are always quick to send a link. Like that's an easy thing to do. Right. Yeah. It's a good nuance. Yeah. Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> you got one? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, I'm Alyssa Martino. Um, I'm in the computer animation degree. Hey. So you all have obviously worked very hard and made yourself stand out in order to get where you are now. So my question is, and this is something I think most or all of us will experience, how do you avoid or deal with burnout? Mm. With burnout? Well, I didn't know that in the beginning, so I burnt out. Um, <laughs> I was like a machine. I just kept going for years and years and years, but it, it catches up to you, so it's, it's, a very, it's a great question. Now, how I do that is I schedule my days off so like on my calendar, it's color coordinated, so work days are usually green highlighted, but I schedule my off days, and they're usually about, you know, I, I do 12 hours an off day, so they're like in red. So that's one thing I do, but I check in on myself. You know, if I'm working on something, and you can get burnt out, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a long period of time, you can get burnt out in a day. So I, I check in with myself after a couple hours, and I say, okay, when was the last time I took a break? Oh, I've been at this since nine o'clock in the morning, it's four in the afternoon, all right, I'm going to chill for the next hour. And I do, like Lauren said, I'll do something completely different for a while. That helps, but you, you got to just take inventory of yourself. It's the best way of doing it. Stay healthy, exercise, drink lots of water. Those kind of things kind of keep you going. Those help me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I was just like Demo in the beginning of my career. I, I was doing music production in studios, and that was back when they would drill you into the earth and could care less about your personal life, your health, any of that. Luckily, I'm in an industry now that actually seems to care about that, and they, they push me towards it. Uh, but it took me a while to figure out that if I don't get the proper amount of sleep, a 100-hour week isn't going to help anybody. It's not going to help me. My brain has to be refreshed. I have to wake up. I have to eat a breakfast. That sounds crazy to mention to people. I work with creative people who literally just wake up, drink a Red Bull, go into the office, and they think, no, that's okay. That's the way that I am. That's because you're 22. Yeah. Stop doing that. It's not <laughs> good for you. Wait till you get to my age. You're going to wish you had never done that before. Find your own rhythm, your cadence rhythm, you know, and make sure that you're following it appropriately because you need to learn stuff. You're not absorbing everything just because you're in a room for 18 hours. At some point, you're sitting there and it's like, oh, how impressive. Yeah. They're going to do anything. They're going to work. But that doesn't actually mean that you're being very productive at all. So give your brain a rest. Give your body a rest. Recuperate. And most importantly for me with burnout, if, you're, if you have a family, if you have a significant other, whoever it is that's part of your life, mom, dad, whatever it is, 
show them some respect along the way. You can't just work 100 hour weeks and expect the people in your life to pick up all the other pieces, handle everything else, except you just do your career. Eventually that turns into emotional problems, you get relationship breakups. In engineering and studio production, I've seen things go, demo would know. I mean, it's really tough to maintain normal relationships in media production until you get the idea of treating yourself and people well and giving that time and space. Because those are the people who are gonna be there emotionally, pick you up when you're having a really stressful day. They'll pat you on the back, it's okay, you're gonna do it, I believe in you, I got you. You treat those people too bad for too long, they're not gonna be there to pat you on the back anymore. Mm -mm. Yeah, I think the key part of this that we wanna make sure we think about is, it's up to you to recognize your burnout, right? Like, your, your employer is not gonna be gung-ho on, on asking you to work less most of the time, right? Like, they're, they're gonna try and get, so you, you have to be the one that says, these are my limits, this is what I'm learning. It's gonna take some time, right? But like, all these things are great, and I would utilize those people next to you to help be that barometer, right? Like, am I working too much? How is my demeanor changing? Am I, you know, am I interacting with you as my partner the way I normally would, or, or am I seeing a little extra stressed? And you know, those things are indicators to help show maybe I need to take a step back, maybe I need to take a break I didn't think I needed. Yeah, I, as, as a fellow computer animator, you know, one of our biggest things is we sit at a desk all day. And I'm including even the standing desk guys, that, that, that you're still at a desk physically. And for somebody like me even more, I like to game, and I game at my computer too. So I know that's even a further extension of how much time I'm at the desk. So for me specifically, um, I try really, really hard to just at times, get, like Demo said, check in on myself and like get up. Because that can be a hard thing for a computer animator. Like, it, it even if you're at a console all day, like it's just, you're in your zone, you're doing your thing, to just remind yourself, oh, you mean I can get up and walk somewhere else? And for me right now, it's amazing, because I've, I've been work from home now for two years, that I like, I, all these little breaks that would happen during the work day, but now I'm home. So that's like this opportunity like, oh, well I can get up and do some stuff in the house. That little break for me is enough to kind of break up the day so I'm not feeling that burnout, which is important because I think like all of us said, it's gonna happen. And it's gonna happen even with the best pre-planning in the world. It's just knowing your, I think that you said this, it's like knowing your limit and being very clear with anybody who's your manager and letting them know like, hey look, I'm having a tough time right now. No one's gonna hear that and go, Okay, gr good talk, back at it. Right. <laughs> you know, ideally they're gonna understand because they've been there too. Lauren, you got something with burnout? Well, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and I know my students know I'm a yoga teacher as well. Okay. And I budget time every morning for practice. And I find the days that I miss practice, I'm more stressed out, I'm, well, I'm bitchy. <laughs> I'll put it out. But I, I find when I take that time and I, I get up at 5 to do it, and everybody's like, well, gosh, you didn't go to bed till 10 or 11. I'm like, yeah, but it's important. I do that for me. So you need to find something that's important for you that is just for you. And, and it's not for anybody else. So you know you've given yourself that time, and you know you've taken care of self. Does that help? Yeah, good question. You good with that? Give it a round of applause. Oh, look at that, you got a mic already? Wow. Yes, sir. <laughs> Hi, my name's AJ, I'm in Recording Arts, okay. and um, my question is, when you're working on a project, how do you know when to stop yourself? Like, how do you know when it's, like, you know it's good, but there's always that voice in your head telling you that it can be better. How do you know when to shut that voice up? That's practice. Because in the beginning, you want everything to be perfect. I mixed a record once for six months. Six months. I'll tell you right now, I can hear that record right now, and I can still continue mixing it. I spent six months. I started. It was the first record we cut on this album, and it was the last record I turned in. And every day, I toyed with that record. I toyed with that record. I heard some different, oh, I could do this. Oh, I can change this. It, it can go on forever. You have to learn, and this is a learning process. You have to get to a point when you say, okay, it's good enough. It's good enough. Yeah. And that's it. And if you have a good system, I, got, I had a pretty good system because I had Timbaland, so I could always say, what do you think of this? And he'd go in and, you know, we would think, well, I, had other, I had Marcella, Marcella who's another Hall of Famer. We came up together, so I would ask her, what do you think of this? She'd be like, no, nah, just do this. 
or finally get to a point where I say, okay, it's, it's good enough. But it, it took a while. Perfectionism is not really a thing. We, we, a lot of us strive for that. But in the arts, in any creative field, it's, it's pretty ridiculous because you'll never achieve it. Nothing's yeah. ever perfect in art. That's the, the nature of art. Art is always evolving. It's, it's, um, it's just a thing you just got to let go, you know, and just kind of work at it. And the more you work at it, you get better. But just get to a point where you say, okay, if this turned in, would I be happy if I heard this later? Yes, great. And if you get a no, you say, okay, well, what's the immediate thing that needs to fix? Okay, I need to fix this vocal. It doesn't work well. Or I need to fix this keyboard. Or, or this shot doesn't really work in the scene. Or this graphic I got isn't really working. Just change it and then put it out. Yeah, I, to add to that, because that, that, that's a really good summary, your peers and getting input from other people is really good. Of course, input is an opinion. So we might not agree anyway, but it's good to hear other, other people's opinions and think of it because we're our own worst critics. But when it comes to managing that, there's two sides to that. One is at the professional level. You know, we work at a, I work at a AAA studio. It doesn't matter how much of a perfectionist you think you are. I'm not giving you five months to work on a one-week asset. It's not happening. So it's not actually going to go any further than that. We know when the cutoff point is. That's when it's done. And subjectively it might not be perfect in every way but it's one of eight million things we have to do this year so if in your head you actually have this mindset that everything you do needs to be this perfectionist i couldn't be any happier with this kind of level you're not going to be a good creative person you're really not it's not actually helpful to think that way it doesn't work if you're working on your own and you're getting started and you're building your own portfolio and prototyping ideas set a time for yourself say, you know what, I'm going to work on this for exactly two weeks. And at the end of that two weeks, I'm done, I'm turning it off, and I'm not going back to it. The next project I'm going to do for another two weeks, and then review the one that I did last and see if I'm getting better or if things are moving along. But set guidelines and set deadlines for yourself and practice letting go of it at that date. Because when you get into a job and you're getting paid, we're going to force you to let go of it on that date, whether you want to or not. That's not... And if I've worked with people who will get to that point and be like, I need three more days and get really adamant about it because they're so connected to their idea of that asset being a certain perfect. Now you're getting to the point where maybe you're not going to stick on the team for all that long because it's, it's really not useful in the long run. Yeah, I mean, so what Tom said on that front is really important to learn. And I, it took me a while to pick this up because as artists, like we, we take such ownership of what we're doing, right? So there's two kinds of things. Is this your project or what I call a client project? And that's really easy. Because anything that isn't yours personally is a client project. And that's an artist, that's a studio, that's a director. It's theirs. And as an artist, when you start on this thing, you're like, well, no, no, this is my shot. Or this is, this is my track I just mixed. Yeah, you think that, but, but it's not. So for me, once I really that sunk in a little bit more, it's like, cool, I'm going to give you this amazing first pass that's kind of like, you know, my take or whatever the first notes were. But everything after that is like, I'm just trying to get feedback to give them, you know, whatever they like. And that, and honestly, there's tons of times I look at them like, I mean, I wouldn't pick that. I wouldn't do it that way, but it's theirs, right? And that's, that's something you're just going to have to learn to sort of like, okay, I, you know, I'll walk away. And I see movies all the time. I see scenes. I'm like, you know, I told them not to do that. <laughs> But on the same note, there's other times I've done that and it's worked out the other way, right? But it's really understanding the difference between those two, right? And how that works. Because if it's for you, take all the time in the world, man. Try to, try to search for that perfection if it works in your timeline. But if it's for somebody else, remember, it is for somebody else. And you're on their timeline. So there's something to keep in mind. And there's a mantra that I <coughs> often teach my students is it's not about you. It's about the project, it's about the goals, and it's about doing it as a team and being in there together. So you saying, it's not good enough for me yet, you know? It's, that's, so, that's the ego coming into it. And you you're got to be a team player, basically. It's not about you. That's all I wanted to add. No, you guys covered it. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Did I help you? Yeah, thank you very much. Hey, you're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we got, I think we got time for one more, right? Over there? Hi, my name is Hunter. I have, I'm a show production student. Hi. Uh, one last question here. I was curious, um, how do you guys inspire your team and increase creativity and efficiency while they're working? 
I keep them, I remind them of why they decided to join my team to begin with. And that usually does a trick because I spent so much time with them, gassing them up, showing them that there's a massive benefit to what's about to happen, that the outcome is going to be incredible, and that it's going to project them even further down the line of what they're going to do. And I constantly keep that carrot in front of them. And at this point, I, you know, I've, it, I wasn't always that good at it, but at this point, I've gotten really good at it. And I anticipate the problems before they happen. So as my team is moving to whatever the project is, if there's a problem, I deal with it right there on the spot. If there's somebody that's not happy, I pull them aside and say, what's going on? You know, this happened in my life. Da, 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 da. And then I work through it. Okay, well, let's talk about it. How are we going to get through this? What do you need? How can I support you? And I make them feel safe. So I create a safe space for them. Safe space for them. And, but yeah, the, the carrot, just dangle the carrot, dangle the carrot. And sometimes, you know, it's lucky when you get a budget, you know, it's, it, that's a good carrot. <laughs> you know, they're like, there's a lot of money at the end of this. Come on, let's get it moving. So, um, yeah, that's my trick. Yeah, and I would, I would say something that is just might be unique to me, but honestly, I, I do not feel like it's my job to inspire anyone. I know that doesn't sound good in a leadership or management position, but I really don't. I don't need to inspire anybody. I do need to show them the way if something is going wrong, right? And not be hypocritical. Mm -hmm. So if someone's having a tough time getting something done, I'll sit down and work with them. Not to remind them that they care about what they're doing, but just to show them we all need that support sometimes. Most people in this room, the thing that you're into right now, even when it gets tough, you're not gonna suddenly lose interest in it. It just doesn't happen. Especially if you're around people that are better than you at what you do, that's insanely inspiring, just watching them go. I work with people that do the kind of work that I do and like half the time it takes me to do it. That inspires me to get better. Like I can get that fast, I can get that efficient, I can get that good. Um, Unblocking people so they feel creative is important, but honestly, if, if I thought someone on my team, no matter what was happening and they had everything that they needed, just weren't inspired and didn't feel it, it it's probably time to go. If you've lost inspiration, what we do is really cool. Mm -hmm. I am a nerd for what I do. I love it. I enjoy my job so much. Stressful, sometimes I want to break windows, but it's in, I, I never lose inspiration on that, especially if I'm around somebody. I'm just like, man, how did you do that? That sounds amazing. I never even thought of that. So you, inspiration comes in spurts, but if you've got a team and it, you think it's your job to inspire people or they're gonna lose inspiration, I, I think you might have hired the wrong person. Mm. Oh, for me, it's, it's more about making sure people get little wins along the way. Right. And so, oh, yeah. you know, where you get a point where and that, that's about listening and understanding what's important to them and the things that help them feel good about what you're doing day to day. Because in a game, this is two to three years we're talking about. Right. Like your initial hype, it's go, it's going to it's going to fade. Right. So you got to get that, you know, you get that sine wave of the good moments and the bad where you're really excited and you kind of ride that for a while. But then you need that next win to kind of get you back up there. And so a lot of that is just about enabling people, understanding what's important and giving them opportunities to let their creative spirit make its way. And, and a lot of it's sharing your work with each other, showing progress updates, letting others see that what you're doing is as cool as you think it is and that it's helping the project as much as you hope that it is. Yeah, I, I, I'm, that was huge because yeah. uh, I try to do that as well. I've also, like, I, I try to let them know I'm invested like not just in the project, but I'm actually really invested in them and what they're doing. And it's such small things. And it can be this, like for me, if it's a, if it's a shot we're working on, and it's a super small shot, I, re I try to notice that up front. And I really try to go out of my way to just, you know, compliment when there's compliments to be had. And th those, and it sounds so stupid, but it, it's such a huge thing as an artist to just get that positive feedback. And I, even, I, even when I'm gonna give notes, I really, really tried to make, to add some positives, even before we get to the notes, just to be like, hey, you're still killing it, whatever else, hey, can we just make this quick change over here? Because it also lets the team see too, like they get kind of like, oh, okay, I'm never gonna get slammed when I get a shot. Like I'm, I've never wanted to be that guy because I've worked with those guys. And I've always asked myself, like I think Tom was like, how did you get to this position? Like I just, it blows my mind, but it's always that reminder. Like, even if it's a shot, I'm like, I'm frustrated. Like, oh my God, I got to redo this, whatever else. I take that deep breath and realize, you know what? I was there. There was a moment I was there. So then I take a step back and be like, okay, how do I approach this with this artist, but still keep it positive, but I'm also going to give you six notes. Like those are the things like to just invest in your creatives. That's a huge, it's just huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of gold y'all got today.
Y'all glad y'all showed up, right? Yeah. <laughs> Lauren? Are we good still? Oh. I think we're she's, ready to wrap get, it up. So I, I want to thank you from the deepest parts of my heart. This has been so wonderful for me sitting here listening to this, and I hope you enjoyed it as much. Um, we are grateful for the time you've given us, and I want to say, I, I don't, are you guys going to be around afterwards to talk at all? or I don't know yeah, we'll what you up. have planned next, yeah, but we'll uh, uh, I... Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.